And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining our second installment of the new monthly Dataversity webinar series, NoSQL Now, with Dan McCurry. Today, Dan will be discussing innovations in NoSQL query langu languages with guest speaker Matthias Brantner. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag NoSQLNow. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And with that, I will give the floor to Dan to introduce himself, Matthias, and today's presentation. Hello and welcome. Hey there, Shannon. How are you doing? Fabulous. How are you doing today? Excellent. Excellent. It's great to have Matthias here. He's one of the great gurus in query language, and I'm just really excited to have him uh, not only here, but also uh, be giving a demo demonstration of some of the stuff he's working on. Hi, Dan Shannon. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get started here. Um, first, I think just to uh, review the format, um, we have about 40 minutes of material prepared, and then we hope to have uh, time for questions uh, towards the end of the uh, webinar. Um, let me just start with kind of a, a giving everybody context here. Um, so, first of all, um, just to, to make sure everybody knows, what we're really trying to do is make sure people realize that we have a lot of material that we're going to be covering at this conference coming up. This is kind of a, a, a preview. Uh, Matthias will also be uh, giving a presentation. We have links uh, for uh, his presentation that he's going to be giving at the conference. But what we really want to do also is uh, give you a, a really overview of some of the really exciting things that are happening. We really call this the NoSQL Now conference conference is because we're talking about what people are in fact doing in production systems today. And I think guys from 28 MSEC are a good example of people that are uh, do production systems using a language, um, although a lot of their stuff is, is focused on Mongo right now. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of uh, other very interesting things uh, happening in this space. To, to give you a quick background on the two of us, uh, I'm one of the authors uh, of the Making Sense of NoSQL uh, book with Ann Kelly, and um, we hope to be seeing that in print uh, next month. We're real excited. And, uh, I just wanted to make sure you, everybody had a good background of Matthias. He's a, uh, a doctor of, of uh, uh, science from um, uh, University of Mannheim. He has a very strong background uh, putting a lot of uh, research papers in but he's been very focused on uh, practical real-world applications, and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. So let's kind of give everybody context. Um, last month, we talked about the high-level NoSQL patterns that we're seeing uh, these days. This is kind of our, our taxonomy of the main types of uh, NoSQL databases. Uh, and the two on the upper left, relational, analytical, most people are very familiar with, and they have a good background for. Um, and the four new ones that are being added by the NoSQL world, the value stores, column family stores, graph stores, and uh, document stores are really uh, uh, the new patterns. And one of the key questions is, um, do you have to have a different query language for each of these systems? And currently today, I'd say that's kind of true. Um, relational systems, of course, all have SQL and analytical uh, systems frequently use MDX, although a lot of them also to use SQL. They also have a lot of concepts like cubes and categories and measures that are common. But four NoSQL patterns have a different approach to these things. Um, key values are very simple, so they don't really have a query language, although most uh, 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 key systems do have REST interfaces, and they allow you to put almost any language on top of those REST interfaces. But the three systems, family stores, graphs, and document stores, each seem to have their own uh, query languages and are starting to, um, people are asking, do I really need to learn all those different languages and can I use one language to query a lot of them? And especially if you're starting to think about agility where you want to have a team of people that are trained in one, um, you, you don't have to learn different ones. And then the other thing to realize is that we're in a distributed computing environment. And this is very different than traditional SQL where you're, if you have two different tables on different servers, you're actually doing a join between those servers and you're sending the data back and forth. 
With NoSQL systems, we tend to have a lot more um, distributed clusters of shared nothing computers where we're sending queries around the network to query nodes. The queries are being distributed around the cluster, and each of the data nodes are then responding. So we think that the query, the role of query languages is more important uh, for interoperability than the role of data uh, moving back and forth. And then we really remember the fact that we don't really have these standards, and that's really preventing a lot of third-party applications from coming on board the NoSQL movement. Uh, one of the quotes I have is from Michael Stonebreaker, who was our um, keynote speaker uh, two years ago at the NoSQL Now conference. And he very clearly said, if you have 75 NoSQL databases with 75 different APIs, that NoSQL movement is never going to be mainstream. It's just going to meet niche markets, much like the object-oriented uh, query languages did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You have to remember that SQL is a platform today, and by platform we mean that you can write applications uh, uh, and make them portable. You write to one common SQL language interface, and as long as those databases have drivers, uh, ODBC or JDBC drivers, uh, your applications are relatively portable. The problem in NoSQL movement is we don't yet have that common standard, and so today we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about a, a potential candidate and what people are doing. Um, and that would allow a new breed of applications to be developed that could use a common query language and maybe even hit different types of NoSQL databases. Uh, I also want to emphasize very strongly that we don't have just one type of data that uh, we're using, not just, just tabular data in uh, traditional databases. We also have a lot of uh, read only data, uh, we have binary data and graph data, we have data from web callers, we have full text, uh, we have a huge diversity of data types that we're dealing with in the NoSQL movement. But we're also dealing with people who are using this data in different ways. Uh, they need security, they need robust control, they need transactions, they need to do analysis on large sets of data, so they only want to deal with uh, making summaries of on the aggregates, the pre computed sums and totals. Um, they still care much more about search um, and the standards like XQuery, Full Text, and Lucene. They care about, care about things like spatial queries, and they want control over their clusters and remote data centers. They want both fast and reliable reads and writes, and they'll be able to fine-tune that consistency and availability. So I, I just wanted to mention this whole thing about standards and what's happening now. Uh, we're very uh, aware that certain standards, like SVG, kind of sit on the back burner for a while, and then certain things happen where they, uh, when Steve Jobs said, well, we're not going to have Flash on our mobile phones, SVG becomes a dominant uh, uh, standard. And we're starting to see SVG in a lot of portable devices. It's very fast. It's very efficient. And other standards like that, you can't really predict uh, when they're going to become mainstream, uh, what key events are going to happen. And uh, for me as a developer, I constantly am trying to struggle if, if I'm going to develop a new app, a database should I target, what's best suited to it. I would much rather write to one standard and talk to many databases, the hub spoke and the right, rather than have to write one app with many different uh, queries uh, and have lots and lots of uh, different software bases uh, just for the same application. So I all agree that standards very very much are involved in lowering cost. Uh, the today wouldn't be possible if it hadn't been a standard like HTML. And we did get HTML from companies like Oracle or IBM or, or Microsoft. It came from small, innovative uh, companies um, that, that, or individuals that are making these standards available. Um, so uh, with these standards come a lot of ability to, to save money. And I'm involved in the U.S. federal space. I see standards saving money all the time. So big companies are also uh, being forced to uh, build services and then web services is a really good example where Jeff Bezos said uh, no groups within Amazon will create their own, uh, will, they will create stand APIs and will show those, uh, whereas companies like Google have pretty much made ad hoc. And so we want to see can we develop corporate data services that are standard for these apps uh, on different heterogeneous NoSQL databases. I think if we look at the lessons of jQuery, we have to realize that adapters for different types of databases are inevitable. Uh, in the, uh, Microsoft created extensions for their browser, and everybody hated having to put in if-then-else code for IE. Now we have one standard adapter, jQuery, 
for example, where we can write our web pages against the standard library, and it does different things based on the browser capabilities. So I think this is inevitable. It doesn't come from browser vendors, right? It came from a third party, and uh, we're starting to see that in the NoSQL space. So there are also other de facto standards, and I, I just wanted to mention that even key value pairs like Amazon S3 have other standards. So we can now uh, take a standard uh, key value store app, uh, run S3, and if you don't like the cost structure, uh, uh, NoSQL databases like RIAC have the same security models uh, that we have in S3. So that's kind of the almost the S3 uh, de facto uh, standard for all those security models. But there's all challenges with adapters. We want to be realistic, and we want to see that each of these adapter systems has limitations. Um, and time these limitations get, uh, get ironed out, but there's something we have to be aware of uh, when we're uh, using a general language to access very specialized functions in these NoSQL uh, no systems. Uh, but before we get big corporations uh, joining the NoSQL thing, these are the types of questions that we have to be able to answer. So uh, we've also talked about uh, can we have one NoSQL database that does all these things? And I'm not going to really answer that question except to mention that at our conference we talk about these issues uh, every year. Uh, last year the guys from 28 MSEC had some very good presentations. Uh, there are other uh, graph companies that are doing very innovative things with their graph databases, and we'd like to be able to see whether or not we can have one language actually query all these different types of data. Uh, the other thing about this is the interfaces. Uh, how are we going to build standard interfaces uh, for those so that we can uh, have many different types of data running in one one large data center with common interfaces. So that's kind of uh, the landscape. I think in the ideal world, what we'd like to get to is where uh, we can use standards and still deal with diversity and have it all run in a central uh, environment. So that's really kind of uh, lead up to what we're trying to do here. Um, so I, I think with that stage being set, that the world needs standards uh, to, to lower cost, and the local industry, although is providing innovation, uh, does need those standards. So with that, I think what we're going to do is we're going to turn it over to Matthias here, and Matthias, I'm going to now make you the presenter, and uh, we'll have you uh, maybe talk a little bit about uh, 28MSEC and what you guys are doing and your perspective on that uh, on those challenges. Thank you very much, Dan, for the introduction and also the invitation to this webinar. I'm uh, really excited about this. So before I get started with, as Dan said, with a demo, I'd like to briefly set the context and explain you very briefly what we do at 28 MSIC. So and after that, I will show you a demo and walk you through a few JSON queries to give you a feeling and show you how powerful a SQL language can be. So what I'd like to start with is I would like to start uh, showing that, that the today's world, and, and we all know that, is full of data, which exists a huge variety of data sources and also in a huge variety of data formats. And then I mentioned it. So it, it reads from completely structured data in regional databases, flexible and nested data formats, such as JSON and XML, down to completely unstructured text. For this data to be valuable, a lot of processing needs to happen to, to turn it into actionable information. For example, the data needs to be extracted from the sources, it needs to be integrated, to be filtered, transformed, cleaned, correlated, or aggregated. And people are doing this today, but mostly cluing and stitching together solutions around a technology that was developed in 1978, which is called SQL. And as you probably imagine, SQL is just not designed for today's NoSQL complex data challenges because it requires first an upfront schema. It works with tables instead of nested data structures as a JSON or XML requires. And the MSEC, we have developed a, a solution that enables people to get from data to actionable information far faster than, than ever before. And part of our, our technology, a language called JSONic, then I mentioned it. And like SQL, JSONic is uh, declarative, which means it's very productive, it's very easy to understand and use, follow the SQL users into the marketplace, 
and also because it's declarative, highly optimizable. But in Compare SQL, it delivers to them what we believe a set of capabilities that enables them to do far more with far more different data formats and with less code than ever before. Uh, Sonic is, a, is an open specification. It has been co-developed by 28 milliseconds, uh, people from Oracle and EMC. And, uh, recently, uh, recently, IBM has uh, announced that they implemented JSONIC in their WebSphere line of, of products. So this should give you a sense of uh, where this is going. So I don't want to show you any more slides, but just uh, get into a, a demo and show you how, how JSONIC actually looks like. See my browser here. You should be seeing the browser. So what you see here is our our product called 20.io. What you see is that I have a list of projects that I've created up front. I'm going to select this product, that is called Mongo SF. What you see here is um, the data browser allows you to to browse your data and write queries. In this, this this project is connected to a MongoDB database, and the MongoDB database contains uh, three collections. You can see them on the upper left: the answers collection, the FAQ collection, and the zips collection. You can one and you have the content uh, in the collection. So, for example, here I can navigate through with the answers collection, clean off the documents, and what you see is in MongoDB, it's a, it's a JSON document stored there that describes the answers of a subset of the Stack Overflow data set. So the answer has a, a question ID, it has an answer ID, it has a creation date, it also refers to the owner who is the guy who, who wrote that question with a user ID. Another question important here is the, the FAQ question, which actually contains um, the questions. Again, the question has an ID, it has a last edit date, for example, it has a title, it has some tags, and it also contains information about the So this shown, I'd like to show you the first uh, actually Sonic query on this data set. With query, what we try to do is we try to get a list of all the answers questions ordered by the creation date and get the title and the creation date out of it. So what I do here is I have a JSONIC query, seven lines of code. It goes through the FAQ collection. It selects all of the questions that are answered. It orders them by the creation date descending. And then it constructs a new JSON object. Here's what we call return clause that projects on the title and the date. And it's already been run, so here you can see the results. What's in about this? There are two things that are very important. The first thing is JSON allows you to navigate in deeply nested hierarchical data sets. In this case, we navigate inside a JSON document and extract the fields with the name is answered. On the hand, JSONIC allows you to construct, to construct new JSON objects. In this, we construct for each of the results a new object contains the title and the date. So seven of code gives you of how JSONIC looks like and what you can do with it. Now take a little bit more so complicated query, more complicated query. In this query, we want to count the number of answers per user. What we do is we go through the answers collection. We group the answers with their owner's display name. With each group, we count the number of answers and define a variable that contains this count. And we order by count descending. And again, we construct for each group a JSON object that contains the name of the owner and number of answers. So in case what you can see, Nifanderist has uh, posted 16 answers. So important about this, it's a nine of code Johnny query, very compact. It does something relatively complex if, uh, if, you, if you're used to doing a grouping in a NoSQL space. It's uh, very brief. It reminds you or it gives you an impression that this is pretty similar to what, what you would do in SQL as well. So we, we group a name. 
we do account on the group and then return new objects. The example that I would like to show is uh, again a little bit more complicated. In this case, it uh, has 18 lines of code, and I don't want to go in all the details, but just give you a more view of the, the more complex thing that you can do in those 18 lines of code. What we do is we go through the answers collection again. again. It is similar to the previous query. We group by the answers display name. With each group, we compute the average reputation of all of the answers of this one owner. And then select the only highest reputated answers. Order them by their average reputation descending. Then we also select a set of answers that are the top scored answers for each of the users. So what we do is we have a nested query shown here that goes through the errors or them by the score descending and then just returns the question ID. And we are only interested in the top three. We use subsequent function to get the top three score queries, uh, answers. And what we do is we return a new JSON object for each group, contains the username, the total number of answers that this user posted, his average reputation over all of the answers, and we also list the top sort answers. But instead of just listing the question IDs that were returned by the nested query here, we do a join between the answers collection and the FAQ collection. So what we do is we go through the FAQ collection and return the titles for each of the questions that matches one of the top scored answers. So the result could look like as a post posted four answers. He has a very high average reputation. In this case, it's, uh, he has only two top scored answers, and these are the titles of the questions that he answered. So this should have given you a, a feeling of uh, snake queries, a simple one that just did a fence and sorting, a little bit more complex one that also introduced Grouping and aggregation, and an even more complex one that is the one that I just have on, which introduces grouping. It shows you functions that you can use, for example, to compute average. It shows you that there are nested queries, there are even more functions like subsequent or distinct values, and it also shows you that the, the language allows you to do joins between section, which is in the case of MongoDB, for example, not easily possible. So to mention another field uh, that Dan already mentioned that would be desirable for, for a NoSQL query language is, uh, is full text. So it also has some full text support. Let me bring this up. So here I have a, a, a small query that imports a module, a full text module. So you can structure your JSONic programs in modules, in this case, the full text module. What the query does is it goes through all the question in the FAQ collection and gets the title out of it using the dot navigation here. And then for each of the titles, it's using a tokenized function from the full text module to type the title. We, in the next clause, we eliminate all of the stop words by using the is stop word function from the full text module. We put each of the tokens in lowercase and grouping by the lowercase token if we count the number of uh, tokens in each group, or count descending and return the token and the count in a new JSON object. So we can see in all of the titles in the FAQ collection, the term NoSQL appears 60 times. The to be in this case appears 20 times. So these are 13 lines of code that are actually really, really powerful. They navigate. JSON objects and using a rich full text function library that shows you that you can do full text tokenization, stop word elimination. The module also has other functions that allow you to do stemming or, or look up uh, words in a thesaurus and, and compare them using thesaurus. So that gave you, gave you uh, imagination of what, what modules can do and what other features are available in, in a JSONic using modules. 
is uh, a very great, good demonstration of a lot of the things you're doing. Read the code. It looks very much like XQuery. Can you tell me how similar it is to XQuery? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good over, uh, observation. So uh, JSONIC is uh, a superset of XQuery, which is the W3C standard for creating X data. What we did is we extended the language and made it a superset and also introduced support for JSON in XQuery's data model and primitives that allow you to work with JSON. In a NoSQL space, uh, there are usually two types of people, the ones that have uh, JSON and the ones that have XML. And, um, so far, there was no real query language that allowed them to work with JSON. So what we did is we, we took the 15 years of experience in developing a, a query language for semi-structured data, and all of the concepts tended it with the, the with JSON and the JSON data model, and this is the result. Uh, in a future example, I will show you how you actually can combine the processing of, of, of ML and JSON in a single query. Great. Is that a question? Yeah, absolutely. So, but bef before I go into that, I would like to sh show you another example. So, we, we mentioned that data is stored in several sources and several formats. And what we want to achieve with the NoSQL is to process this data across sources and formats. So, what we did at 28 MSEC is we extended uh, JSONIC with modules that allow you to connect JDBC data sources. So it's what we do is we import the JDBC module, and we have a connect function that allows you to connect to JDBC data source. In this case, it's an RDS uh, MySQL database hosted on Amazon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a join here between our um, DB database, specifically the answers collection, and a table from the JDBC database. So in line number eight, what we do is we again read the answers collection. We, similar to previous queries, we, we do a group. We, here we group by the answers question ID. So this we get within each group the maximum score for all of the answers in that group. We order by the maximum score descending. We select only those uh, answers that have a maximum score that is higher than 50. On that, what we do is we, we use the JDBC module to execute a query that allows us to get the FAQ data from the table that is stored in this MySQL database. The data set is similar or exactly the same than the one that I've shown you in the MongoDB database. Uh, this time, the data comes from the JDBC data source, from the SQL database. So what we do is we do a select star from FAQ to get all of the data. And this function returns the original data transformed into JSON, into a flat uh, JSON document. After that, what we do is we do a join between the question ID coming from the JDBC data set and ID of uh, the answers that we extracted using the grouping here. So this is our, our join condition that allows us to join the answers on the question ID with the actual question ID from the FAQ table. And then return a new JSON object containing the title and the max scored. Uh, so what you see when we execute this is it gives you a title, and in this case, good reasons not to use the relational database had the highest scored answer with a score of 117. So that's 19 lines of code. A lot of code actually was spent on connecting to the JDBC, the source. But what it shows you is that you can very easily join data between two different sources that is present in two different data formats. In this case, in um, MongoDB, the answers collection, and uh, FAQ table stored on an RDS MySQL database, Amazon. Okay. So now I would like to switch uh, briefly to a different project that I created here. I didn't say anything. This project, what we do is we, 
implement a use case of one of our customers. So today the, the trademark office publishes all of its data using on a, using XML, using a zip XML archive. In this case, the data is on the storage Google APIs. And what we have here is a file called APC uh, 13.06.01, which is the trademark data from the, I guess, the 6th of January in 2013. So what we do in JSONIC is, is we make an HTTP call to return, to get, to retrieve this zip file. Then we have another module that allows you to extract this file to get the text out of the zip file. So what we do is extract the text out of the file that we retrieved from the web. And since we know it's XML, we use the parse XML function from XQuery to parse the XML. Us, we apply a path expression and an XPath expression from XQuery to get all the case files out of, uh, out of this file. And then what we do is we navigate in the file. In this case, we get the mark identification of the trademark, of each of the trademarks. We mark identification into uppercase using the uppercase function and bind it to a variable called name. So this, we create a new variable called E for metadata here that contains for each trademark a new JSON object. And this object contains the real number of the trademark. So we contain a field called SN, and the value is uh, constructed by evaluating an XPath expression on file that we retrieve from the web. It also contains the name, which is the mark identification of the trademark. And it contains several other things that we use uh, uh, later to query this data set. In this case, it contains the full text tokens of the mark identification. So the token string function will return us a set of tokens, which then is uh, in an array into the token field. It is a field called MP, which stands for metaphone key, which is for each token a special key that later on allows us to do a phonetic uh, search on the trademarks. And then it contains uh, three more fields, the owner, the status of the, the trademark, whether it's live or dead, and the class. And each of, this, each of these JSON objects that are constructed are going to be inserted in a MongoDB database called trademarks. It is we retrieve the file from the web. We unzipped it and parsed it. We got a lot of data out of it using XPath and construct for each of the trademarks a new JSON object, which is later on inserted into the trademarks database. Actually, take a look. Could I just, just review the significance of this? What, what you're really saying is that um, even if we have very complex XML data sources, that by just using very simple XPath expressions, uh, we can parse that complex uh, XML data without ha actually having to write XML parsers. We give it short path expressions. Is that a good summary? Yes, very good summary. And most features in, in this example come from the XQuery language. So, so go to the, the trademarks collection to, to show you one of the entries that was created. So in this case, the trademark with the serial number was uh, was inserted into the database. The name of the database is, uh, of trademark is this. The full text tokens, there are three full text tokens. There are three metaphone keys here that are later used for a phonetic search. And uh, the owner, the status, and the class. And the trademark database contains around uh, 8 million, 8 million trees. And then what what we do in a in a second program is we actually uh, query the when when a user enters a search on on the website of the trademark lawyer that we build this application for. So what happens on, on the search side is the user puts in a a search. In this case, we use the example Saloon Africa. We do the exact same thing to this search than we did to the, the mark identification to the trademark name, which is we, we tokenize it, put the terms in this case in lowercase, we also compute the metaphone keys for each of the tokens, and we 
construct a, a courier uh, that actually not used just a small sorry we through the through the trademarks collection and uh, get all of the uh, all of the values that match and what we do is we we apply ranking here i don't want to go into details in order to make sure that the search is ranked we uh, the only the ones that have a score created in zero, we order them by the score tending and then return a new JSON object that contains the serial number, the name of the trademark that was found, and the score. So in this case, South Africa is a trademark that was found, the search that matches the exact search, hence it has a score of two, but it also, the result also contains trademarks that only match Africa, or in this case, Celine, which is something that might phonetically be similar to to saloon, and that's what trademark lawyers actually need to search for. Shows you another very interesting uh, case that we implemented for one of our customers. So we got XML data from the web because we have a MongoDB database. We transformed the XML data or some of it to JSON stored in MongoDB, and later on have, have a queries on this MongoDB database using JSONic that allow us to quickly search for trademarks that uh, create the, the search that we want to do. And yeah, that's about all that I that I wanted to show you. And I'm going to give a presentation back to to Dan now. Yeah, I, I'm very impressed. That was uh, what I'm impressed by is the amount, the number of lines of code that you actually have to write seems to be very short. There, there's not a lot of these, you know, 10-page uh, SQL queries that I've seems like I'm used to uh, in the past. Um, and ju just to, to verify, right now you're um, pulling data from other sources. Um, can you also write uh, updates? So, for example, could I take data from my Mongo and insert it into a relational database? Absolutely, absolutely. So I've only shown you examples that actually query data sources, but for example, using the JDBC interface that we have, you can obviously also do updates on the JDBC data source, and JSONIC also has an extent that allows you to do updates on JSON documents or XML data. So you can either manipulate collections, in entries in it, or also modify document in a collection, for example, uh, place the name of a field name or delete a field from a JSON document or replace the value of a, or a value in, in a JSON field. Uh, and then one other question. Um, several of the native XML databases that I'm familiar with also have an XQuery update uh, function. Uh, is there some way to get the hooks into those update functions also? We don't have uh, functions that allow you to do xQuery updates, but we have the xQuery update certification implemented that gives you a syntax to do so. Oh, okay. So you do implement that that standard? You do implement that standard. We only have functions that allow you to modify actual collections because xQuery update doesn't specify that. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, it's, it sounds like we answered that question. Uh, uh, one of our... Uh, Audience members asked, "Is is JSON for really data? How to write data?" So I think you've you've answered. Yes, you can do inserts, uh, deletes, and updates on other data sources as long as the API permits those things. Yes, the TEM import example actually contained at the very end a function call to insert a JSON object into a, a MongoDB database, MongoDB collection. That sounds good. So um, just let me just kind of understand the status of where you guys are at as a company. It sounds for each database um, that, that supports JSON, you do need to have some kind of adapter written um, so that uh, your uh, language composite to the database-specific API. Is that a summary? That is correct. So what, what we did is just big MongoDB to us seemed the fastest Chrono SQL database. We have implemented a very deep support for MongoDB. We have a lot of uh, optimizations that, that make that such JSONic queries are evaluated very efficiently on top of MongoDB. So, for example, we we leverage uh, we leverage indexes 
is where the, the MongoDB database has indexes on the collections. Um, we we push on projections and stuff like this. But we also have a lot of other connectors, more lightweight connectors, similar to the JDBC module that I've shown you that allow you to talk to uh, Elasticsearch, for example, or to Couchbase, or to Cloudend. Are you doing any work for you yet? Are you doing it with Solar, the Lucene? Uh, uh, no, we started with Elasticsearch because that's what a customer asked us for, but it would be uh, very easy to do to do solar as well. Yeah, right, right. So um, it seems like uh, the core language is up and the compilers and the, the things that interpret the language, and now you're, you're, you're really being driven by customers to build adapters to different uh, data sources now. Is that a good summary? Good summary, yes. So our, the language is up. You can, use it. you can use it on MongoDB and all the connectors that I just mentioned. And if people have uh, other needs to connect other sources, then uh, we might look into those as well. But I, I believe that right now we, we cover a very good uh, set of connectors that will find useful. Okay. And, uh, and they could just go to the jsonic.com uh, website? Is that right about those? Uh, there, there are two things. There is uh, jsonic.org, which is the open specification is not proprietary to 28MC, and it defines the, the core language, the core language and the core update language, and also defines a, a set of functions that allow you to do common stuff to work with the strings, to work with data, uh, stuff like that, basic stuff that you, you need. And then 28MC has uh, extended Sonic with those function libraries that are at the moment proprietary to, to 28 MSIC uh, that allow you to connect to other sources and uh, do more stuff like also the, the SIP module that I showed you or the HTTP module. And, uh, so th those are two different things. One is in our product, one is in the specification. And we're happy, obviously, to, to contribute those extensions back to JSONIC if people feel the need. But we wanted to keep the, the JSONIC core small in order to allow others to implement it and not overwhelm them with the uh, features that customers in, in their scenarios might not need. Okay, great. Hey, we a good question just come over the wire about whether or not a JSON, a JSON query could be spread out over a cluster of servers, so many nodes, uh, have those each run in parallel and then potentially send the results back into the original query node. Well, that's a very good question. So as I mentioned, at the beginning, JSONIC is a declarative language. And being declarative, it allows you to do a lot of optimizations. One of the optimizations that you can do is actually parallelization, automatic parallelization. And in our products, we actually implemented that. So what, what we can do is we can take any of the queries that you've seen, we get it and decide if it's parallelizable, and then split the execution over several processes processes or potentially machines operating on a subset of the data, doing uh, filters or aggregation on this subset, and later on command the results. So that's kind of a map reduce uh, runtime model. But uh, yeah, that's a very good question, and you can actually do that. And that allows you to use JSONIC in big data scenarios. Okay. So it sounds like um, you can certainly use JSONIC to do that, but there each uh, NoSQL database is going to have to implement an adapter to know how to send the cores out to individual nodes and cluster and get them back. Um, so in in our practice, if you are connectors, it really doesn't much depend on the data source. So we could you could get the from a JDBC data source and have that parallelize on the result of that. Or you could get the data from a web service and then parallelize the execution on the result of the execution of that web service. Now, it depends a little bit on the query, but you can, with native source, you can parallelize in the 20 at MSEC runtime your, your queries. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, we get a question uh, about is JSONIC being considered uh, for a standards body, I know that many of the people that design JSON 
Pete Sonic, of course, all came from the W3C uh, X Query Working Group. So you know a lot of very senior people uh, within your organization that have experience with standards. Do you know? Uh, is there any organization other than uh, your, your kind of a loose affiliation of the people involved in the language uh, that's actually considering uh, the standardization process for the language? So, yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, at the moment, JSONIC is co-developed by people from 20 milliseconds, Oracle, and EMC. And, uh, we have uh, a bunch of uh, independent implementations being in Pascal from yeah, so that just contacted us and let us know that there's an implementation, and then also IBM, who hasn't been contributing to the standard to the specification, but implemented it in the in web sphere. So we see a, a lot of traction happening there, and we're very excited that other vendors implement JSONIC as well. Um, but in terms of standardization, it's JSON.org at the moment, and we are still thinking and also waiting to see where this is going. It might be ITF, it might be the W3C. Yep, that makes sense. Um, by chance, are you coming to our NoSQL Now conference in San Jose? <laughs> yes, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be speaking there. Uh, I think the title is called Do More with uh, JSONIC and MongoDB. It's a title talk. And so having as a company, we're going to have a booth to give more and more and talk to people and understand their use cases. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so I think we've nailed that question there. Um, so another question that came up, uh, is there an equivalent for writing stored procedures uh, database via JSONIC? That is, uh, I, I think more people out there know about um, stored procedures, but people don't really know that JSONIC is a functional programming language, and so functions are kind of built in. Do you want to talk about that? So, uh, as you said, JSONIC is a fully functional language, and it tells you in the language itself to define new functions. You can just declare a function and implement the body of the function using JSONIC. And what you can do is you can group those functions into modules, similar to the modules that, that I've shown you, the full text module, the HTTP module, or the archive module. All of those are groups of functions that are uh, available in the query processor. And obviously the user can, can do the same. They can only at the moment in, in 20 MSEC only write the query using JSONIC and not using, uh, using a host language like C++, but we might be looking into that as well. But yes, in 20 MSEC you can define something that would be to stored procedures. Very familiar with uh, Priscilla Wamsley's Funct X. Uh, um, she has all these very, very useful functions. Um, is there a way that I could potentially call those in Sonic? We actually ship them as well in, in 28.0, and if you use the, the, X, the JSONIC extension to XQuery, then you can call all of those functions directly. Oh, fantastic. Or right, here's a really wild question for you. Are you you're familiar with the EX path? Uh, standards that are uh, people are putting their extensions for the XPath, uh, which is for for doing things like FTP and and uh, authentication and encryption. Uh, yes, yes. To hook those EXPath functions up into JSONIC. Uh, so exactly the same FunX and EXPath is a set of modules that are specified in the W3C community group, I think. And uh, you've actually in the demo seen one of the, the modules that is specified by EXPath, which is the archive module. This oh, uh, 20 sec together with the BaseX developed, and we implemented it, and you can use it from XQuery or JSONIC. Very good. All right. I, I think that uh, uh, really nice because there's just so many functions that people need to use. I just, for example, I was working on a project uh, a while ago where I needed uh, OAuth authentication to be able to get things from Twitter feeds, and able to use those libraries means that I don't have to rewrite uh, OAuth uh, function modules over and over again. I, I, what's really interesting about this is that a, as a SQL developer, I'm expected to be able to, uh, from SQL, go to Twitter and do a query and get the data back. But in XQuery, it's like 
uh, X query is a programming language, so you, you kind of expect all of those functions to be there. Um, what's your what's your take on the difference between when people come to a language like uh, JSONic? Uh, what, what's the difference between um, the framework you have in SQL and the frameworks that you have in JSONic as far as using external uh, data sources? And what, how we see JSONic moving forward is to be more of an orchestration language between data sources and formats. So what you have is you have you have sources like the web, like a relational database, or like any NoSQL data store like MongoDB. Then JSONic being orchestrating the processing between all of them. And since it's eclectic, what what the hydrogen can do or the query processor is make sure that it chooses an execution plan that is efficient for the data sources that are that are being used. So we see XQuery not really as a, a query language for one particular database, but more than an orchestration language between sources uh, and formats. And so other function libraries like like the that the full text module or an integration with the R the statistics tool. Okay. So, so just my, my take on that is that if if we had a team of people in a big company that knew JSONic, we have to be writing ETL and SQL and and have all these data languages for doing data quality and data cleanup. Uh, we could have one team that one language and one tool and one framework. And it's reusable, functional, declared programming language, um, and all the ability for doing agile data transformation would go through that one group. Um, is, does that make sense as far as you? I mean, it seems like NoSQL has kind of uh, put the persistence problem in the back burner, right? It's no longer a problem. Can I take these JSON documents and store them and retrieve them? It's it's a done deal now, right? Um, and you don't really have to use as many joins, and you don't have to uh, worry about all the uh, details of hibernate and object relational layers. Now the focus is on who's the most agile, and it comes down to who can transform data the fastest. Is that a good summary? It's a very good summary, yes. So uh, we believe that, that the, the rise of, and as Michael Stonebreaker said, the amount of NoSQL databases that, that appeared, uh, all very, very good and they all solve uh, very important problems a lot of uh, the persistent problems and the scalability are solved together with the cloud but we believe that um, the thing still needs uh, some work and compared to sql we actually made the uh, made the step back uh, because we have many different languages and people started to develop a lot of functionality that should actually be in the database themselves. So for, for example, if you take MongoDB, which can't do joins on purpose between uh, collections, but some people still have to do joins. And so what they do is they take their host language, for example, Python, and write the 300 lines of code Python program to join to MongoDB collections. And we believe that Developer time is uh, more valuable, and that not every developer should invent the new join algorithm. And that's where we believe uh, JSON will be very, very helpful. Okay, that makes sense. I have a couple of other questions uh, that that came in. I'm going to try to make that every sh make sure that everybody gets at least uh, one of their questions uh, answered. Um, uh, what I came across just now was. Um, uh, the analytics, uh, the fact that I know a lot of people are starting to run uh, R as their language, and um, R also is kind of has a functional programming uh, bent to it. Do you foresee in the future having libraries that could call an R statistic package in the future? Uh, we are actually already thinking about how such a module could look like. There's already a prototype that allows you to call R function, put data into R, and get it back, uh, yes, that's definitely something that we're looking at. Because as I mentioned, we see JSONic as an orchestration language. So yeah. we want to build up on the, the best of breed uh, solution out there, and R is definitely one of them. Right. Yeah, so I think my, my experience is that using R is, is fantastic once you have the data all cleansed and in their exact right format and, and things, and you, you effectively just send it to a Ceph engine and get it back. So that could all be done through uh, a JSONic module, then, is what you're saying. Exactly. Okay, makes sense. 
Um, let's see. Uh, there's a couple other questions about performance. Um, if you uh, wanted to benchmark a, a query that used the native Mongo, um, is a templating language? Is that a good description? Yes. Uh, so, so most most NoSQL systems start out with a instead of a fully functional programming language, they start out with a very simple templating language, uh, which may, may not support recursion and functions and, and, uh, and external libraries and things. Um, but uh, one of the uh, questions seem to imply that they'd like to know what the additional overhead uh, is from um, and the JSONic uh, on top of a Mongo uh, system versus the templating language. That's a very good question. So Mongo does an excellent job in very efficiently executing all of the, the queries that they can express in their query language. And um, if you write a query in JSONic that has the exact same semantics, it's our job to make sure that we get the exact same performance. And we can only do that if we delegate the work to MongoDB. So we would act only as a translation layer between on time and the MongoDB runtime. And in this case, you, you would have an additional network hub for the query, so it will not be the exact same performance, but you will get a similar performance. Now, obviously, if you're you are interested in a five milliseconds response time, then this additional network hop will kill you, and you should continue using the the DB API. What we really aim at is the more complex queries that people are struggling with and implementing using their host language. So I mentioned the join already, and and we see this in all all use cases where people are using MongoDB. And if you look at the MongoDB users mailing list, there are a lot of questions about joins or more complex queries. And in this case, what you need to do is you need to compare a JSONic program against the handwritten solution in Python, Ruby, or Java against MongoDB. And in this case, there are, there are two things to consider. There's the productivity in writing this way, and there's the the performance in, in evaluating it. And I believe that by pushing the pressure onto a query optimizer like it is done in relational databases, in the long run, you will achieve much better results because it to solve problems across people and not a particular problem that somebody has. So to give you an example, what we do is if, if there's an index declared on one of the collections in, in MongoDB, and you want to join it with another collection, then we would actually leverage that index and join and, and put do an efficient hash-based index join in our runtime between those two collections. And a NoSQL developer would need to do it. Would take him actually a lot of time to get to the same performance as, as we do. Good. That 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 makes a lot of sense. Uh, you're coming up to the top of the hour now. So I think what I'd like to do is maybe wrap up and thank everybody for joining us. I know we have a lot of uh, attendees that have stuck with us for the whole whole thing. So obviously, it was very interesting. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we have a few references. Um, we'll make sure to get uh, some of the uh, questions uh, that people ask out um, in, in a follow-up. Uh, this is a great session. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, everybody knows that the NoSQL conference uh, registration is open. You can see uh, not just Matthias, but uh, other people all out there. We have the link uh, here. You can register now. And uh, I think with that, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Shannon, do you have any last words for us here? I think you pretty much covered it all, Dan. And Matthias, this was a fantastic uh, presentation. And of course, in addition to meeting Matthias, you can meet Dan in, at the conference. As Dan is one of a uh, fan of the conference itself. Uh, and again, everyone, thank you for the great interaction and the great questions. Uh, we'll get the links to the slides and links to the recording out to you within two business days, so by the end of day Thursday, and with uh, all the additional information Dan just mentioned. So hope everyone has a great day. Thank you again so much for the presentation. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. And then thanks, Dan. Bye. Thanks.